The first item on our agenda tonight is approval of the agenda. Are there any revisions to the agenda? Uh, there are no revisions, but I would just like to mention that we have several of our administrative staff members who are on the agenda to present. They're not here, so we'll cover for them. I'll cover for Dan and for Ron, and Kelly will be covering for, uh, for her team. So, um, yeah, just to let you know that. There being no revisions, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Terry, I'd like to make the motion that we approve the agenda as printed. Second. Second. Um, the motion has been approved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it, and the agenda is approved. The next item is reports, and we'll start with the superintendent's report. Mark. Thank you, Terry. Um, the first is a uh, bond project update. We still have uh, three projects that are live. Uh, Central Middle School and West Middle School uh, just entered the commissioning phase. So they'll be testing all of our systems right now. Uh, uh, FISEX is our uh, commissioning agent. And they'll be working for probably the next couple months, uh, making sure our mechanical and our HVAC systems are, are operating properly. So uh, that's underway there. Um, and being it's nice to be in person, you probably drove by the uh, natatorium on your way in here and saw, you know, that's coming along very nicely. Uh, the site work there has started. Um, some of the finished work on, uh, on the retention uh, ponds, uh, that's being graded. And there's also a lot of prep work being done for our sidewalks and the parking lots. Uh, a few light uh, fixtures have gone up outside as well. Uh, inside, uh, the uh, Heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems are uh, going to be starting up this week, so that'll be tested. Uh, interior finishes are ongoing right now, so there's still tile work happening, ceiling tiles, painting, uh, fixtures being installed, so a lot of progress, uh, primarily there in the locker room area. On the pool, the, uh, there's a mud coat that goes on over the concrete that's poured, so that, that mud work is being laid over which the tile then will be placed. So that is, being, is happening both in the pool and in the walls surrounding the pool area. And they'll be starting tile work uh, at that facility next week out in the pool park. Uh, and lastly, uh, the elevator will be going in at that facility. So I had a chance to visit last, uh, last week, towards the end of last week, and it's, it's like a swarm of bees inside with the workers there. A lot of, a lot of staff uh, on that project. So any questions on those projects? Okay, Mark, good. did they fix the internet problem at the two middle schools? Uh, it's the, the fix has not arrived yet. We're still waiting for core replacement. So they, we keep getting back ordered on the parts, on the key parts. Many of them in, but there are a few that are missing yet. So those are targeted, I believe, uh, April 29th to come in. And then Dan has arranged for, a, uh, uh, for some technology that are, I think, from Dell, if I'm not uh, mistaken. The folks from Dell will be there when that's being installed. They want to oversee that installation. So I, I can't tell you because I don't know what the... Uh, connectivity has been like the last few days. Um, I know there were some Google issues that were statewide today. Um, that wasn't part of our issue, but it was a statewide issue. But we're, um, we're still monitoring and doing everything we can until we get that core. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. The next uh, item on the agenda is, and then I'll have, I have a few more uh, that I want to add to this, but I want to have Paula uh, Johnson come up and just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what's happening with our planning for the 21 budget. Is this on? Can you hear me? Good evening, Board of Ed and Superintendent B. Lang. Just going to give you a quick update on where we are at regarding building the budget for next year. House and Senate for the state of Michigan have been on spring break recess and they're gonna come back in session tomorrow on the 13th. At that time, we, they plan to work coincidingly with allocating the SR2 money that we haven't received all of that yet and then also education committees will meet to formulate their budget recommendations before it comes out of House and Senate committee. 
to the floor to be voted on. Um, the next revenue estimating conference, which is a very important tool that we use to see how the state has hit its targets, is scheduled for the middle of May. Rumor has it that we are doing very well and pacing ahead of schedule for budgeted revenue targets that have been established. I would like to wait to see that revenue estimating conference to confirm that, but it was discussed at a legislative update meeting that I sat on last Friday. I also want you to keep in mind that at this, at, as of this time, we only have the governor's executive budget recommendation for an increase of $164 per pupil for next year, and then also a new categorical for declining enrollment. Even though we may not have our budget recommendation at this time for next year, my office will be moving forward to start working on amending the general fund budget for the second amendment and then also building the budget for the 21-22 school year side by side. And then we'll also amend the lunch fund, the debt funds, and the building site and sinking fund and bringing all that to you in June. I'm sure that I will also be updating you with House and Senate information as that becomes available in regards to their, their budget recommendations for next year. And that's all that I have at this time. Thank you, Paul. Um, just a, a few other quick things. Uh, the, the survey that we're doing on elementary facilities is, is closed. That closed uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we had uh, right around 1,100 surveys that were completed. So Gary is in the process of, of uh, analyzing those. Uh, as you remember, the, uh, on May 3rd, we have a special meeting schedule at which the results will be shared with the board and the community. So just a big thank you for uh, to all those people who completed the survey and provided us with some, some valuable input that we can get. A reminder that on May 5th, we have the uh, KC SOA meeting for board members. Uh, that's a, a virtual meeting starting at 6.30. So if you, I don't know, I, I think you have probably received the sign-up information. So uh, it, it, it's, the topic is, social emotional learning and uh, some of the work being done in the county and it's a panel presentation so it should be pretty fast moving and uh, with a lot of good information there. so hopefully you can join us um, earlier today i learned that uh, kalamazoo county health department is ready for the next phase of vaccines for our six, those that are 16 years and older uh, they could start as early as next week and uh, we'll be using the same logistics system that, uh, that we use for staff members. So uh, Kay Risa would be coordinating that. Uh, Brad Galen is our, is our local contact. So he'll be working with, with Tom at the, uh, uh, Tom Zart at uh, Kay Risa and trying to figure out the best way to, uh, to you know, get our students vaccinated as quickly as possible. The, the specifics are not yet known. Uh, however, I, I do believe that all the Vaccinations will be administered, the vaccines will be administered out at the Expo Center. They're geared up very well out there to handle large crowds. Uh, they can do in an hour what they might do if they were off site. So we're really uh, hopeful that that gets started as quickly as possible so that uh, we get as many people vaccinated uh, as, as we can. And then the last thing I have, I put it here places the uh, K Risa annual report. This is from the 2019 2020 school year. Uh, it's formatted a little bit differently than, than it has in the past and, and really is uh, organized around the different functions that an organization like K Risa uh, provides to local districts and to our greater community. So uh, please take a look at that. Uh, their superintendent, Dave Campbell, has offered himself or anyone on staff that, that can, if, if you'd like to come to one of our board meetings, uh, perhaps this summer, to review this and answer your questions. But uh, again, please take a look at that. A lot of good information uh, provided. And it, it gets through the, the first three months of our COVID uh, situation last year, which was the tail end of the 1920 year. So that's kind of a, a launching point and included some of the uh, some of the things that they did around so that's all I have for, for your information. Okay, very good. The next item on our agenda is board education, the extended COVID-19 learning plan update. And I assume Kelly is gonna be responsible Kelly for that. Jensen.
Senius has graciously offered to do that uh, while her colleagues are dealing with uh, some personal health issues and some other issues. So not, not COVID related as far as I know. No. All right, can you hear me okay on this one? All right, well, good evening, Superintendent B. Lang and trustees. Tonight, I will be presenting our monthly COVID-19 extended learning plan for reconfirmation. Let me make sure this is working for me. There we go. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at our current health data as of today. Um, we have seen an increase in our positive testing rate within Kalamazoo County. Regionally, we are at a level E and have a seven-day new case average of 115 cases. Let me move that. And currently have zero outbreaks in Portage Public Schools. Um, we continue to implement or implement our cleaning protocols. We're wearing our masks. We're distancing to the extent possible. And we're putting in those other safety measures throughout the district um, that we have proven to be effective. At Central High School, our in-person students who have opted in are now being randomly tested. Uh, the first week of that random testing had one positive result out of the 50 students who were tested, um, which led to a positivity rate of 2%. So that's a new thing that we've just implemented. Um, we expect to randomly test more this week as we've gotten additional consent forms from families. Um, we are now also testing over 600 middle school and high school athletes weekly. We started that last week where we had a 0.93% um, of student athletes who tested positive, and then this week that number declined to 0.46% positive. Um, and we continue to watch this data and we'll continue to look at our matrix, but just kind of wanted to share that with you. Number of total cases since we've been back from spring break, um, I have a total of 18 students and one staff. So just kind of putting that in perspective, I know that was a big piece that people were wondering what was gonna happen there. So that's where we're at currently. Um, now I wanna take a couple moments just to kind of look at our K through 12 programming. We of course continue to deliver instruction using our PPS approved curriculum four days a week. Um, we're using KVIC. We have students participating in our virtual asynchronous program. Um, in all our programs, our support services are provided to our students who have been identified needing tiered support, as well as those with IEPs, 504s, and English learners. Um, Fridays do remain as asynchronous learning days based on standards for all students with professional learning and planning for staff. What we've added here in this fourth marking period is to utilize Fridays to administer the M-STEP assessment to our students. So, this Friday, we will begin with our fifth graders in all our home buildings, taking the ELA portion of the M-STEP. We do have transportation and breakfast um, to be provided to those students who signed up. Virtual students were also invited to participate um, and that this testing, like I said, takes place in the home building because it does have to be administered on site. So this isn't a test that we could say do at home. You have to do it on site. Um, we are also administering this week the PSAT and the SAT for our 8th through 12th or 11th grade students. So the, a lot of spring testing happening right now and we felt uh, Fridays were a good way to utilize that and getting the kids in the building and get some of that testing done in a nice quiet environment. Um, looking forward, um, just give some updates as of um, today. Overall, as a district, we have a percentage of students in each mode of learning at each level. Um, I'll break that down by building over the next couple slides, but here you can see we have a range of students attending face-to-face. -face. So we um, are at 41.8% at high school, which is a 17.27 increase from the marking period before. We're at 58% at middle school, again, another 17% increase. And we're about 72% at elementary, which is a 5% increase. So um, we obviously increase earlier in the elementary and a bit later with the middle school and high school, getting kids back in. Um, and so the next slide breaks that down. And we looked at this last time, but you can kind of see um, the numbers of students at each building and each mode of instruction. And it does range face-to-face, 65.9% -face, um, at Amberley, up to 86.2% at Lake Center, um, seeing that. And our KVIC has, staying, has been stable at that point at the elementary. 
And then at secondary, this is where we're seeing probably most change that we didn't see last time. Um, so central middle school, we're at 64% face-to-face. North middle school, 56%. West middle school, 52%. Um, those are all our face-to-face at the middle school level. And then high school, central high is at 45. Uh, Northern is at 36.8, and community high is at 52%. So, um, and we're still under about 1% at each secondary building for KVIC enrollment. You can kind of see what's been happening there with our enrollment. Um, and as we go on, the one piece we do have to report, let me go back. Um, on this slide here, our attendance rate that we do report each time, you can see that um, some positive changes in our detailed attendance trends. We, um, we have resumed making those attendance calls in the buildings, letters going home to families if kids are missing school so that they have some more accountability happening there. So we're hitting around 97% as of last week, where um, March 22nd we were at 96%. And then Finally, we are looking forward um, and getting some planning going for um, this upcoming school year in the summer months. So as we move into those summer months, we're looking at our next steps and how to best support our students and our staff. Um, we are currently gathering information for K-12 virtual enrollment for our families so that we can plan accordingly. As we learned, it's a lot of planning that goes into putting together virtual options for our families. Um, we're also developing our summer, summer learning plans at all levels, and we're in that development phase right now. Elementary and middle school, we are looking to utilize small group supports. Um, and at high school, we're going to focus more on that cre um, credit recovery and career pathway opportunities for our students. And we are working with Paula and the business office to make sure that we have the right funding in the right place uh, to be successful with, with this work for our students. And finally, once again, we'll do our amazing Teach Camp to support the professional learning of our teachers and staff in August. That's underway currently, and we look forward to another um, Teach Camp to kick us all off this fall. And thank you very much. I, if you have any questions, please let me know. So Kelly, is the testing optional or not optional? So when we do, when we talk about MSEP testing, We've got some interesting options there. So the state says at um, our virtual students, some of that language around that is that we aren't making students come in if they're virtual to test, but we do need to offer the opportunity to come in and take that test. And so we have put out to all our families to say, here's that, if you need transportation, come on in and take this, you know, to take the test, we, we've got you covered, so. Um, and what about secondary students? Same. Same. So yeah. if they're virtual? The way it's written, yes. But we're, you know, we're encouraging if you would like to come in, we are here to support you sure. to come in and take this with us. But we do know we have some families just, they're virtual for a reason and they're not comfortable coming in. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Well, I did just, just to ask, I don't know, curious questions, so like kids don't have to take the SAT? Oh, I'm sorry, I was speaking more to the M staff. Okay. Mark, did you want maybe with the SAT and PSAT, that level there, I don't have that answer. Yeah, I, I'd have to find out exactly, you know, on that one. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that I, you one. You know, those kids that, uh, that are applying to colleges that, um, that require an SAT, obviously are in a position where they're going to have to take that. Um, it is part of the state testing portion of the, of the state testing, so, but I'll find out and let you know for sure. I just think right now, you know, nobody likes assessments, but they're so crucial right now because you don't have data, um, you know, it's just going to be scattered all around, kids coming in in the fall not knowing where they are, and if you don't have assessments, how do you know where, how do you know where to start? It's going to be. Yeah, I, I would say our benchmark assessments have been invaluable to us, being able to um, go through that process three times a year, um, looking at NWEA results, looking at our Acadians, and working through that. That's going to definitely help us guide our students and our teachers in supporting our kids, for sure. But. but you bring up an interesting point. We will not have the same kind of data for monitoring reports now for the second year in a row because 
not every student will have to take that. And so the results are going to be mm -hmm. just for those students who took elected to take the test. So it's going to be another one of those asterisk, asterisk years mm -hmm. for our reporting purposes. But again, as Kelly, I hope you heard what Kelly said there, we do uh, benchmark assessments okay. that, uh, that really provide us probably more valuable information than our MSTEP does because we can respond to that in a more uh, a quicker fashion in adjusting student instruction. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. The next uh, item on our agenda is our comments or communications section. Do we have anyone signed up to comment this evening? No one signed up. Okay. Are there any comments by board trustees? I guess I'm just happy that we're in person for, I mean, it's been months, but it's nice to um, all be sitting around the table together. It's actually been six months. That is months, I guess, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Yes. Anybody else? I would, I would echo that, and that would then make this Keith's first in-person meeting. So. Yes, it is. Right. Yeah, yeah. Y'all look, y'all look great in person. I gotta say. Welcome. You're a good liar, then, too, right? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have any board committee reports? Oh, uh, very quickly, Terry, when you get home, you'll see an email from me. We're trying to set up owner linkage for Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Yep. All right. I'll look for that. I'll look for that. Okay. Now we move on to our consent agenda, which includes the approval of the minutes from March 22nd, the regular business meeting, as well as the Chartwell's contract renewal for 21-22. So if you want to look those over. And then moving on to action items. The first action item that we have today is the Staff Appreciation Week proclamation. Is there a motion, please? It's on page 12. Yeah, Terry, I'd like to make the motion the Board of Education approve the 2021 Staff Appreciation Week proclamation as presented. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay, the motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All right. Uh, should we read the proclamation before we I, approve it? Yes. I, I would be honored, yes. All right, thank you. Um, this is the Staff Appreciation Week proclamation. Uh, whereas a strong, effective, free public education for all children is critical to our democracy at the national, state, and local level, and whereas a strong public school system makes for a strong community, and whereas the vision of Portage Public Schools is to be an exceptional, continuously improving learning culture with high expectations committed to all, and whereas the, committed, the commitment Portage Public Schools teachers and staff show to students by inspiring them to succeed academically, artistically, socially, and athletically is essential to making the vision a reality. Therefore, the Board of Education of Portage Public Schools does hereby proclaim May 3 through 7, 2021 as Staff Appreciation Week in the Portage Public School District and encourage all citizens to congratulate our educators for the work they do every day to develop students today and mold successful citizens who will have a positive influence on our community tomorrow. Adopted this 12th day of April, 2021, Portage Public Schools Board of Education. Thanks, Bo. All those in favor of uh, approving the 2021 Staff Appreciation Week Proclamation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the Staff Appreciation Week Proclamation is approved as presented. Okay, the next item is to reconfirm the extended COVID-19 learning plan. Is there a motion, please? Uh, Vice President Mulberry, I move that the Board of Education Reconfirm the 2021 extended COVID-19 learning plan as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion? Um, I just want to thank once again the staff and everybody for I do this every meeting, but we balance uh, continued learning with staff safety and children's safety and. And we're really just trying to come up with a thing that pleases everybody. So uh, I think we're all in a lucky place. So uh, thank you to everybody. Thanks, Rusty. 
Okay, all those in favor of the Board of Education reconfirming the 2021 extended COVID-19 learning plan, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion is approved. And the next item is the K. Risa Biennial Election Resolution Number One. Is there a motion, please? That is on page 19. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution to consider designation of electoral representative for the June 7, 2021 biennial election as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I understand that uh, in the cover memo it explains what the process is for this. So we approve the resolution and then we'll have a couple of more steps at future meetings to finally get this pushed through. So um, tonight we're just approving the resolution to consider. So is there any discussion on this at this point? Uh, I mean, just to note, uh, what was noted at the bottom of the memo was that the, the trustee up for re-election is Lynn Coward, who is who well known to us. Yes. Uh, well known to us and long-term service at KB7. Good point. Any other discussion? Just that we, the board has done this before. Um, there's one person running. You just have to designate someone from the board who will be able to go vote uh, on June 7th and then um, who they're going to vote for. So that's this is just setting the stage for that to happen. Okay, all those in favor of approving the resolution to consider designation of electoral representative for the June 7, 2021 biennial election, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And the resolution is passed. Okay, uh, we have some discussion items to move on. Policy revisions, um, bylaw 0131.1. Yes, thank you, Terry. There are a number of policy revisions that are being recommended that we modify. You know, they almost fall under that technical corrections to our policies because this just takes some of the recent um, federal, mostly federal laws that have been passed. Uh, and aligns our policies to be uh, compliant with federal law. So um, again, there's a, a brief summary on each one of those. Uh, some are repeated. You put them in one policy for staff, and they have to be uh, repeated for other, um, for other units of staff, professional staff, support staff, administrative staff. So a lot of them look the same, uh, but uh, uh, represent different groups. Um, a couple of new uh, policies about uh, do not resuscitate orders that uh, that we have to be in compliance with, as well as uh, as this uh, physician order for scope of treatment. Uh, is a, those are new policies. So uh, again, if anyone, any board members would like to see what those new policies are, or would like to take a look at the changes, those are located at the office, and you can stop by any time to take a look. Uh, typically. Board members haven't gotten too involved in the operational uh, policies, but they are there for your perusal if you care to. I'm just curious, well, that thing, I, I could look it up for sure, but uh, the do not resuscitate. There's a change there? It's, it's, a, uh, it's a law that, that we have to now follow those orders okay. as a school district. So, so the parent it, signs off on that? You, we as a district cannot sign off on that. But the parent? Uh, this would be an order that for that particular child, you would not resuscitate, yeah. which kind of is counterintuitive for right. the work we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we have, to, we have to follow that law. Okay. So, so that has not changed. I was just curious if it had changed from when I was a minister, because that's you just couldn't touch it. Yeah, I don't know specifically what the what the rules were at that time with the federal Do not was. touch. Yeah. Do not touch those kids. Yeah. Which is, as you say, counterintuitive to what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any other questions about those policy revisions? Okay, moving on, uh, we have the Northern High School 2022 student trip to Japan. Is Sarah not here to present for us on this? 
Sarah is, and she's going to present from uh, from here or wherever. Oh. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Am I allowed to, can I take my mask off? Yes, you can. Mic? Okay. <laughs> All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Very well. Can you back me up to the beginning? Oh, that is the beginning. <laughs> Never mind, here we are. Thank you, Bo. All right, so I have a little presentation for you guys. Um, is this on the monitors in front of you as well, so you're able to see? Yes. Um, so this is just, I'm, I'm giving this to the board tonight because I've done this exact same trip before. So I figured for approval process for this time around, I could actually come with a little bit of photographic evidence. Um, so what I have for you is some details about the trip itself, like why I choose to travel with the company I choose to travel with, and then just some fun pictures of kids. <laughs> so this is why I choose to travel with the company I travel with. Um, they provide a lot of things that other educational travel institutions do not things that I'm not necessarily comfortable traveling without. So my students have um, traveler assistance, medical insurance, and travel insurance as a non-negotiable part of the trip. Um, so by enrolling, they are insured. Um, our guide stays with us the entire time, so we don't get handed off from person to person. Instead, we stay with the exact same person the entire duration. Um, we are centrally located, which does not seem like a big deal, but a lot of times cheaper student tour companies will cut a couple of hundred dollars off the price and then say you're going to Venice or something similar. You aren't actually staying in Venice, you're staying two hours outside of Venice and spending four hours on a bus to get into Venice a couple of times a day. Um, so it makes a surprising difference for student experience. And for all of the things that they include, after the international airfare, which is, of course, the single largest portion of the trip, the money works out to about 250 bucks per day for all meals, all guides, travel insurance, and four and five, or three and four star hotels. So really, really good. Um, it's a, you know, an, an intimidating number when I show parents, um, obviously, because you can't, you know, can't fly to Japan for 200 bucks, but I really like this company's um, sort of breakdown and the things that they include with their business package. So that's what World Strides is. I choose them uh, for several trips. So now just some fun little photos of kids. This is not this past summer, but summer before, I think. Um, I went with myself and another colleague from Northern. We're at the Imperial Koi Gardens in Tokyo. We learned how to make sushi. I was terrible at it. <laughs> this is a place called the Nara Deer Park. Um, it said that when the Buddha attained enlightenment, no humans were present, only deer were present. And as a result, deer are the most enlightened creatures. So this national park is a home for a huge, huge herd of domesticated deer. Um, pet tame deer because they're considered holy creatures and you walk inside the park, and I'm not making this up, the deer are trained to come up to you and bow, and you give them a biscuit, and then you bow back to this deer, and you feel like a GD Disney princess. It's about the <laughs> coolest thing. Um, really, really good meals. So this is not like um, bagged lunches. This is true, beautiful, very unusual um, cuisine, and. Almost every meal was a learning experience for the children as well. So not only were they eating unusual things, they were learning ways of eating that they had never had to do. I don't mean just chopsticks. I mean like boiling pots on the table, barbecue on the table, you know, very unusual methods of eating. Um, I was so proud of my kids. I would hear them say, I have no idea what this is. I better eat it. <laughs> you know, good, very good, sort of outside the box. Um, there were lessons. So we took calligraphy lessons, language lessons. We stayed um, at the left, you can see myself and two, or my, two of my colleagues are in a traditional um, garb. We stayed at a very, very traditional onsen, which is a steam bath in the mountains. It's a, a mineral spring hotel, so it's like a vacation spot for um, uh, urban Japanese citizens. They go out to the mountains to these onsen for their vacations, and we went to one too. Um, really amazing cultural and historical sites, obviously. So Osaka Castle on the bottom and the right and the Buddhist um, temple in Nara Deer Park on the top. And sake. <laughs> Couple big cities. So we um, go to Kyoto, Tokyo, Osaka, um, Nara. 
um, several, we're in each place for about two days. So there's about five cities, 10 days. I would love any questions. You can ask me now if you'd like, or you can email me if you think of it after the fact. But I just thought you guys would appreciate that little slice of happiness. And um, hopefully, I'm, I'm really looking forward to going again. It was intended to be this past summer, but clearly as I'm presenting to you now, it's going to be this upcoming summer. Um, I'm also traveling to students with Italy this upcoming summer. Uh, that trip has already been approved, so I'll be gone for almost a month um, traveling with students this upcoming summer. Um, World Strides has been doing a really good job with uh, cancellations and um, moving as well, so I've been very pleased with their refund and um, reallocation uh, plans and stuff like that. So, yeah, questions? Any questions for Sarah? Oh, I have one. Hey, um, so Sarah, with the Japan trip, how do the students uh, deal with the jet lag? Do they just power through? How do you, how do you deal with that? They, they power through. <laughs> um, my personal patented system that I really try and encourage them to do is to, and it's agonizing, but to not sleep very much on the flight. So it's a 14 hour flight. If they can make it essentially that first 24 hours, like a full 24 hours of travel, and then just crash at 7 p.m. or so on the first day, you know, like sometimes we land in Osaka, sometimes we'll even take them out on a walk after dinner, like, come on guys, just hang on for another 45 minutes, you know. If they can make it through the travel without too much sleep, they really do okay. Unfortunately, when they get back, <laughs> when they're back with mom and dad, I hear that's when the big crash happens. But so far, um, we had really good energy levels, so, Thank yeah. You. I noticed your point about the center city accommodations, and I know when my kids have gone on trips with various organizations, sometimes exactly what you are talking about happened, that they're yep. staying at the airport when you're in Prague and you want to see Prague. Right. And the, the walk after dinner that you just mentioned doesn't really happen when you're staying at the airport, exactly. and that's when you see a lot of culture. Yep. So I am really pleased to see that that's something that yeah. you have it's valued. Really, it's really wonderful. I also saw that it said three college credits if the students yeah. want that. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? So of course, accreditation depends on wherever the student hopes to apply the college credits. So right now, U of M, for example, is basically accepting nothing, AP, IB, <laughs> you know, they're going to be U of M. But the three college credits that are available are, it's almost like a, um, I would call it like a travel journal. So the student enrolls in the institution that it's accredited through, whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, it's an online college before we depart and starts doing some like writing and like planning and so forth. And then as we travel, they do some writing and planning. And then after they return, they do reflections and sort of it, like a photo diary almost. Um, and they submit that sort of uh, like a big research paper um, and it's three credits. Wow. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't even calculate that in with the financial part, but it is very good. So what if they enrolled at KVCC, got the credits through KVCC, then could they transfer them to some other places, or is that... You know, it is, it is so tough to say. With, with transference and with people accepting versus not accepting credits, um, I, the specific institution is not a local institution because World Strides is an international company. Mm -hmm. So it's not through KVCC, it's through the specific online college that okay. World Strides has a partnership with. Um, but, I, you know, all I know is that I've had students do it in the past. I don't know whether the institutions that they ended up in for their degree chose to accept those credits, but I've had students successfully do the, um, sort of they, they called it a travel journal. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, now we have a few more items. The digital signage, I think, Mark, you're going to talk about that. Yes, thank you, Terry. Um, Dan has uh, really been looking at the uh, and discussing with the, uh, the two campuses upgrading the digital signage at both Central and Northern High Schools. Uh, he's been working with SignArt out of Kalamazoo. Uh, and asking that uh, we expend $59,040, uh, the, the funds which will come from the building and site sinking fund to replace those two units. Uh, they were, they're over 10 years old now and are reaching the end of their, their life. Um, this upgrade will not only replace, but also move those up to color, uh, uh, full color, and uh, and you can see the, the rationale that Dan has, the information he's provided there. Um, so that would be a, a nice upgrade to that. 
Um, as Dan mentioned, Sign Art was the only bidder that responded to the RFP, and, and he has his uh, reasons why he thinks that's so because of some of the existing infrastructure that's there. Uh, they also installed the original signage that we've had there. So he has no hesitation in recommending that, and uh, the, the, the allowances under the Building and Site Sinking Fund uh, allow us for uh, to, to fund that through that. Um, so this is a one of those cases where the BSSF is more flexible in doing this than are the bond funds, because mm. that would then be considered a maintenance item through bond funds, and we can't use bond funds for that. Do these use the existing structures as is? Yes. The, the framework, the masonry? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're really talking about the panel that's inside of that, mm -hmm. that structure. Good. So if you have any questions, uh, I probably won't be able to answer them, but I can forward them to Dan, and he can get that information to you if, uh, if you have anything between now and the, uh, the next meeting. So I would like to put that on the consent agenda for the May 10th meeting, if, uh, if at all possible. Okay, and then we have uh, the surveillance storage purchase. This, yes, this is another one that uh, is coming from Dan, and he recommends that, uh, that the board approve the purchase of a storage system from, uh, from a company named 45 Drive. They are out of Sydney, Nova Scotia, in an amount not to exceed $271,958.72, and that would be from the 2019 bond unallocated contingency funds. So um, we do have over 600 um, individual cameras now. Uh, some of that technology is, is outdated. Some of the newer cameras are higher resolution and takes up more storage space. So we're really in a position where we need to upgrade those in order to keep up with the demands of, of surveillance. Um, it is, this item is on the list of enhancements that, uh, that are being considered for, uh, for the use of the bond funds. And uh, it's one of those things we, we've come to rely more and more on the use of video surveillance for as different things arise with, you know, with uh, behaviors and, uh, and that on, on the part of our students or non-students for that matter. Um, we did not issue an RFP for this. Um, Dan feels that the 45 drive solution is the, is the, the best to fit our needs. So, um, and then he's also asking, because of the timeliness of this, uh, to get this installed and, and uh, in place for next school year, that if, uh, if the board is so willing to move this up to an action item tonight, um, so that our vendor in ask, is asking for a uh, order by the end of April, and with we, the fact that we only have one meeting this month, it just uh, kind of presents some additional problems. So again, you can see, uh, some of the, the more technical information there that uh, Dan has provided. Is there any discussion or questions? Well, I, I do have a question. So do, is the storage physically on site? I believe it is now, So it's yes. not, not, this isn't something to put it out on a cloud somewhere or at a remote? Server. I believe this one, well, we would have a dedicated server on this one that we don't have right now. Okay. So it, it really expands our ability to retrieve information store it for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you know that time? I mean, are we storing it for a week now and we're going for a month or do we go from a day to forever? How does it work and what it's are It's not the forever. I don't know if anyone... I think it said something about 30 days. That, that we do now? Yeah, it said something in there about 30 days and then uh, right now we're having trouble keeping up with that. Mm -hmm. And so I would bump it, and I think they like to keep 30 days. Our, yeah, okay, our goal is, yeah, as Dan said, our goal is to maintain 30 days of, of, of footage. I mean, we can always save, you know, if we know we have to save something, we can save it. Sure. But, but for looking back, we, yeah, 30 days is, is it's what you want. Right. by 30 days. So you can't go be. back till September 1 or something right, like right. that. And you won't be even after we spend this $270,000. Probably not. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to move this to an action item? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that uh, we move the surveillance storage purchase to an action item. Is there a second? I second that. 
It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of moving the purchase of the storage system to an action item, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we will move it to an action item. Now is there a motion to approve the purchase of the storage system? Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I move uh, that the that we purchase the storage system from 45 Drives, Sydney, Nova Scotia, in an amount not to exceed $271,958.72. Proceeds drawn from the 2019 bond unallocated contingency funds. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, see, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And it is passed. And the last item on our agenda is the wayfinding signage. Uh, this one is, uh, this recommendation is coming from Ron uh, that the board approve the purchase of new way, wayfinding signage for central and northern campuses from visual entities. The cost of $112,016 will come from the 2019 bond fund proposal one. So we've, if you've driven around at least, well, both campuses, we have some temporary signage that's been up there for a while now. Uh, we've been ver working very closely, Ron has in particular, very closely with the administration at the, the, uh, the buildings on those sites and, uh, and has a plan for signage. Um, this, is, this is a very high quality product that will be similar at both campuses. Um, I'm told that it's almost like an automobile finish on some of this so that it's not going to fade. Uh, it's got a long guarantee. Um, and uh, we, we still have the opportunity here to, to make sure that everything is right before it goes into production. So there's a number of eyes looking on this, but uh, um, it'll be exciting to have, uh, have everything visually laid out and help people find their ways around our complex campuses in some mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. So um, you can see that the, the bid that's being uh, recommended is, is not the low bid. It, it kind of falls in the middle of where the bids came in, but the uh, level of confidence that we have uh, in this company uh, is, uh, is one that we'd like to go with. Okay. So this is a uh, um, this is a discussion item, not necessary to go to action at this time. Any questions about this? Just a comment. Um, you know, we're, we're doing the electronic signs out front, and we're doing these wayfinding signs. And I always just kind of look at the outer parts of our building are like the front porch, and I just think you know this is really going to make things look nice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think we needed it. <laughs> um, Curb appeal. This is good. I, it is frustrating while going back down uh, Millen and seeing that sign out front with no message on it. And I never liked those those red signs, anyways. But uh, yeah. well, this stuff this stuff's going to look really nice. Yeah, 10, 11 years ago when those were installed, that was probably the uh, you know cutting edge technology mm -hmm. at the time. I don't know. The real nice thing about this too is that it just provides a unified image for our district and for our buildings. Many years ago, I worked on a similar thing where I was working that we had branches all over the area and everybody had a different sign and it was horrible. And once we could have that unified image, it just really made a huge difference. So this will be great. Any other questions about the wayfinding signage? Now, as I look back, I see that that resolution vote we were supposed to do as a roll call vote. Should we redo that or are we good? Okay. Okay, great. Is there any other business to come before the meeting? If not, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Good job, Terry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We're out of here early at least. Yeah, right.